synapses. Okay. So, talking about the events of action potentials, the action potential is propagating along the axon, then it's going to get to the end of the axon where it is going to synapse uh, potentially with another neuron. All right? And at this point, you know the standard kind of synaptic um, story. We're going to look at that, yes, but you know, I think we, we need to have a bit of an open mind now about the nature of synapses. So we've got one neuron here. Uh, a neuron there, and it's got some uh, dendrites. And the dendrites can have multiple synapses with another neuron, and even that neuron, um, it's sorry, uh, it's going to have terminal branches, and the terminal branches could synapse with uh, the dendrites of another uh, neuron, which itself could have multiple. Uh, synapses with many other different neurons which all synapse with it. So this could be the situation, so we kind of have to understand that this is just the basic mechanism that we're talking about and this is more along the lines of what it actually might look like. Not only that, um, you have frequency of impulses that could affect whether the action potential is going to be generated in this cell you have not only frequency of impulses, but um, maybe if the impulses are coming from many different neurons. Not only that, some of these synapses are likely to be positive, others may be inhibitory synapses that have opposing effects, and it's the overall balance between the positive and the negative synapses, how many impulses are coming down the positives versus how many are coming down the negatives, that's going to determine whether the action potential is going to fire in this cell or not. So, bear, in, bear this in mind, we'll come back to that later, but basic synapse, action potential arrives, depolarization causes calcium voltage-gated calcium channels to open, voltage-gated calcium channels open, calcium ions move into the axon, this causes the um, synaptic vesicles to move towards the presynaptic membrane, fuse with the presynaptic membrane, and the neurotransmitter that's contained within the vesicles diffuses into the synaptic cleft and towards the postsynaptic membrane. On the postsynaptic membrane, you have these voltage, uh, sorry, these ligand gated sodium channels. So these are sodium channels, but they are not voltage gated, so it's not, they're not sensitive to changes in voltage, they're sensitive to the neurotransmitter. So when the neurotransmitter binds to these sodium channels, the sodium channel opens, and again, the sodium, because of the electrochemical gradients, the sodium will move into the cell or into the postsynaptic uh, cell, beginning the events of depolarization. Okay, and that is the end of that story. But what you, I mean, that's the basic idea that if you have sodium here, then action potential will be uh, caused and a new action potential will now be moving down this neuron. Okay, but it's not as simple as that. We need to have this idea that some neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft opens some sodium channels. Some sodium channels opening doesn't necessarily mean enough sodium channels have opened to cause an action potential. The idea is, no, not there, the idea is that when you have the resting potential, you've got a resting potential, you've got action potential somewhere up here, you've also got this other thing called 
threshold potential. Okay? It's not as famous as the other two, but it is there and it is significant. That's the level of depolarization that you have to reach before enough sodium channels are open to, to cause enough influx of sodium ions into the axon to reach the action potential. So if you get a little bit of depolarization right here, so some sodium has come in, but no more neurotransmitter is being released, and so the sodium gets injected back out again, then if you don't reach the threshold potential, that little bit of depolarization that you had, it doesn't turn into an action potential. What you need is maybe one impulse that releases a little bit of neurotransmitter that opens some sodium channels, but then you need another action potential in the presynaptic neuron in close succession, i.e. at a sufficient frequency of impulses, that causes more release of neurotransmitter, that causes more release of or, or influx of sodium in the postsynaptic neuron. And it's only when you cross, when you get enough sodium coming in to cross the threshold potential, that is when you develop the full action potential. So this idea is very important because it essentially means that you need, you know, you need an in, you need a strong stimulus in order to generate, to get the signal responded to. And that makes sense. You know, some signals are low level, they don't require a response, and so this idea of integration or summation, as it's kind of referred to in the NXL, this idea of summation, the idea that more than one impulse is needed in close succession to get enough neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft, to open enough sodium uh, channels in the postsynaptic neuron, to get enough sodium into the postsynaptic neuron to reach the threshold potential and then cause an action potential. That idea is important and that's why this is important. Yeah. Um, so, the idea is that there's more than one way to get that action potential generated in the postsynaptic neuron. Either you have temporal, either you have temporal summation, i.e. same neuron but a high frequency of impulses that cause the release of enough neurotransmitter, or you can have spatial summation which means you've got one neuron with, you know, you've got maybe a number of different neurons, each with a low level of, or, or a low frequency of impulses, but collectively these three presynaptic neurons release enough neurotransmitter to get the um, action potential generated in the postsynaptic neuron. While we are here, we will also talk. We will also talk habituation, because we. Am I on the screen? It may be that you've got a low-level signal that doesn't need to, or low-level stimulus that doesn't need to be responded to. In that case, organisms have evolved methods of habituation. And in some ways, you know, it's kind of similar to learning that response, uh, stimulus or impulses are moving down this neuron, but they don't result in uh, action potentials in the next neuron. Why is that? Well, so the mechanism for that is if, if there's kind of repeated low-level stimulus, over time, this voltage-gated calcium channel becomes less sensitive, becomes less sensitive, therefore fewer calcium ions enter the cell when an action potential arrives, and because of that, less neurotransmitter is uh, released than would otherwise be, 
and therefore is less likely to cause an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. So it's all to do with the sensitivity of the voltage-gated calcium channels when it's a kind of low-level but frequent uh, stimulation. Okay, that doesn't need to be responded to. <clears throat> okay, also on the subject of synapses, I did mention excitatory and inhibitory synapses. So each synapse can only be of one type. Okay, and what we're saying is that while some, so we're all used to the excitatory synapse, neurotransmitter is released and the neurotransmitter causes um, an influx of sodium ions which is eventually which is responsible for causing depolarization in the cell and the depolarization is taking the cell towards an action potential, excitatory. But a different type of synapse could 